Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. It's time for another conversation about nuclear weapons. It's not exactly a heartwarming topic, but we'd better handle it. I think today, maybe especially, we'll talk about uh, Russia's nuclear weapons. I have two experts with me, um, only they're, you know, on different continents, but uh, one of them is Pavel Padrig, who's in Geneva, Switzerland, where he works. And, uh, and we were trying to pin down what label to put on him. Uh, Pavel uh, claimed some identity uh, in 50 words or less. Uh, I, I, I run my uh, project on Russian nuclear forces, and I'm also a senior researcher at the UN Institute for Disarmament <laughs> Research. So, so the UN? You end up, uh, okay. It's a research institution in attached to the UN. It's not... Uh-huh. All right. Thank you. All right. Good. And in Washington, D.C. is Hans Christensen, who uh, is a little bit broader in his focus. He's uh, He talks about nuclear weapons in general, not just Russian. Uh, so hello, Hans. Good to be here. Uh-huh. Good. So these two guys interact quite a bit because they're trying to keep track of where we stand in this world of nuclear weapons. And it's time for an update. Um, everybody's, uh, at least a couple of months ago, I think, Putin got us all scared with his waving his nuclear weapons around and intimidating everybody. And so nowadays, I guess that's, that's one of the things that we need to uh, consider, whether or not we should all get really scared. And if, what, if we do, then what the hell can we do about it anyway? at this point in time. Um, but let me ask something even uh, a little bit uh, off topic already, because of course there's the, the reason for this concern is that there is a war going on in Ukraine. And uh, something I read today isn't about nuclear weapons in particular, but I thought I'd ask you about what you think anyway. And, and that is, I read someplace that um, it's some intelligence outfit estimates that Russia is finding it hard to accumulate enough um, ammunition for the uh, strikes that they're now carrying on against the the Ukrainian infrastructure, and uh, uh, that's okay with me if they run out of ammunition. But I want to ask your opinion. Um, do you know anything about that and uh, how? Uh, how uh, much difference does it make in our thinking about what to expect of these guys? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to know exactly uh, what the uh, supply and demand, if you will, uh, is there. Uh, it is. Uh, it appears that the the, the rate with which uh, Russia uses uh, its uh, uh, longer range missiles, uh, cruise missiles or uh, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, kind of short range. Uh, it, it does appear that it would be difficult for Russia to sustain this kind of a rate of uh, use. These weapons are used uh, largely to attack uh, civilian infrastructure. Uh, and uh, it, it appears that Russia has kind of a, enough uh, to to sustain that that kind of operation, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, but it's difficult to to know uh, uh, precise numbers. Here. Mm. But that kind of operation is no small feat, you know, because they're doing, you know, they're shooting everybody everywhere, you know, all kinds of places that they hadn't been going before, right? Uh, well, it's it certainly the the idea is, uh, as I understand it, uh, is to uh, damage, to inflict enough damage uh, to uh, the electricity generation uh, mm -hmm. system, and uh, so uh, people. It's it's cold in Ukraine. Uh, it appears that uh, this uh, this kind of campaign uh, does not really. Uh, affect the morale in in Ukraine uh to to the extent uh that would undermine the uh 
the will of uh, Ukrainians uh, to, to mm -hmm. resist. That's... Yeah. Uh, you got to hand them credit for a lot. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how um, their military campaign has evolved um, because uh, it seems to me first they were shooting, um, you know, sort of more randomly. <laughs> um, and I heard from U.S. intelligence people that they found the Russian, earlier on they found the Russian missile campaign kind of odd in the sense that it, it it sort of hit here and there, but it did, it wasn't sustained. Um, and so they didn't come back to, you know, they didn't come back to, um, to sort of make sure that a target or a target system had been cleaned out, so to speak. Uh, it wasn't really a Western way of doing targeting. <laughs> um, but later on here, um, we've seen, um, a shift, it seems, where they're going, like like Pavel indicated, to sort of a, a you know target sets that include more of the civilian infrastructure in terms of electricity and 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 mm -hmm. by secondary effect also on on water supply and these types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be um, a different effort, like he said, to to sort of try to influence the will of the the people of Ukraine, you know, to continue to fight. But, you know, these things can get repaired and they are repaired after a while. And so unless you keep up the pressure, um, you know, they're bound to sort of restore to some extent, um, so, you know, supply of electricity and, and what have you. Well, you know, with the, the West or the U.S. especially, I think, has been supplying them with a lot of weapons. But uh, how quickly can they repair uh, the damaged, uh, you know, power lines and water system and stuff. I mean, the U.S. can't help them overnight with a thing like that, can they? Not overnight. No, it takes it takes some time to rebuild it, of course. But my point was more that in order to have an effect here that's lasting, you have to you have to sustain the pressure. You have to continue to come back and mm -hmm. and, and clean up, so to speak. And and I do think it's sort of. You know, we, we've been able to see that some of these systems, the, some of the weapons, uh, the missiles that are being used, they're beginning to sort of reach into uh, the categories of weapons that are older, um, less precise, uh, indicating uh, perhaps that they either want to save some of the newer ones or, you know, maybe running a little low on inventories and therefore have to reach back into the the storage sites to get some some older systems to to use them in there. Um, but again, it's not it's not a black and white picture, and mm -hmm. and and this attack we saw this morning, which appeared to have included something on the order of seventy or so uh, uh, missiles. Um, well, I have. I'm sorry, I haven't read the news today. Yeah, There's there was a new, there was a new barrage this morning, um, and but several of them apparently were of the newer kind, the KH-101. So so they're not they're not excluding newer missiles it's not like they're they have run out they're still willing to use new missiles on it as well so we'll see where they go with it there's an, another question along the same lines for me which is that i was uh watching one of these expatriate russians who's you know fled the country and is re streaming about what's going on in russia and uh, several weeks ago he raised a point that i i would like to follow up on which you may know about or not apparently uh, he says that that years ago, or not too long ago, uh, the Russian arm, uh, go the government told everybody to be very proud because they have a whole fleet of new, uh, what he called, I think, Armada tanks, which are very, you know, high-powered, terrific, beautiful, gorgeous, super-duper tanks. And uh, you should just uh, just wait to see how wonderful these things are going to be in the battlefield. And And he says they haven't used them. He says, where are they if they have all these tanks? Why aren't they using them? And, and do they even exist? Is this something that they made up to make us feel happy while they stole our money? It's not entirely unusual uh, in uh, in many militaries, and especially uh, with the with the Russian and going back uh, to the Soviet days, uh, kind of Soviet uh, <clears throat> A defense industry uh, that uh, they produce something that uh, is, uh, as they uh, usually say in Russia, has no uh, uh, 
similar system anywhere in the world, so it's better and all that. Uh, as I understand that uh, the the this uh, this tank was uh, was indeed produced uh, in some quantities, uh, small ones. Uh, it is quite expensive. Uh, it is not. Uh, there is no uh, kind of sustained production. And uh, as I understand, the the attrition rate of, of right, when you see attrition rate, what do you mean? They they it's easy to wipe them out on the battlefield, or what? Or I, I think, in my understanding, again, I'm not I'm not an expert on, on these things, uh, but uh, my understanding that uh, tank you you need a lot of tanks uh, to wage mm -hmm. this kind of war uh, because they are being destroyed in some quantities. And we've seen that uh, Russia actually went and uh, uh, took some of the tanks uh, from, uh, I think they were in the 60s or the 70s out of the uh, warehouses. Uh, uh, the, the West, uh, uh, NATO countries, uh, or the United States, they are uh, concerned that they are supplying weapons to Ukraine, uh, and uh, but uh, they're... The, the kind of quantity that this uh, war requires uh, is really uh, may not be sustainable uh, even uh, even in the West. My, from listening to this guy, of course, he doesn't know anything. Uh, I mean, he doesn't claim to know much of anything. Uh, but it, I got the impression they weren't even using them at all. He says that the only he seemed to think anyway that the only tanks they're using are the old junk. To, you know, tanks that left over from, you know, previous wars are never used at all. And that they haven't even brought out their super duper tanks. Um, and, and, uh, but if, from what you're saying, maybe they are using them and they're getting wiped out quicker than they expected. I, uh, my sense is that it, it, it doesn't really matter that much in the sense that mm -hmm. even if that tank uh, was used somewhere, uh, I, Seriously, doubt it would have made any difference. Well, let's talk about nuclear things then. And I, all I want to know is how scared should we all be, and why, and what should we do about it. So, who wants to either allay my concerns or um, exacerbate them first? <laughs> yes, we should be concerned uh, because uh, weapons are there. Nuclear weapons are there. Uh, there are. Uh, ways in which those weapons can be used. Uh, some of them are uh, in very high uh, degree of readiness. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, and uh, we can see uh, kind of pathways uh, to to escalation. So that's the so uh, the uh, so that's the uh, so we should not be complacent. That's that's in my view. Uh, however, uh, if we're talking about the uh, the immediate danger, uh, again, my take is that uh, we are. Uh, we are at least several steps away from the point where uh, there is a real danger of these weapons being involved. Are we s still steps away or were we closer and they moved back? I mean, were, were we actually closer a few weeks ago when, when Putin was, you know, boasting He's... about what he might do? And did well, he retract or retreat a little bit in his intentions? Or did China pull on his leash and say, hold it, uh, did, cut, cut it out? So the way I, 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 I'm trying to think about these things is that, uh, again, the, uh, the, the, the threats uh, that President of Russia uh, was uh, making and uh, they were... Uh, of a very specific kind. Uh, basically, the message there was uh, that uh, it was a defensive message. The message there was if Russia is attacked, then Russia would respond. 
So, so that was uh, that was uh, the. Uh, well, that was always the case, but the question was well, that was about the time they started gobbling other other places, you know, these provinces up and calling them Russia. And I guess the question was, does it apply to these places too, uh, or uh, otherwise? I mean, it's taken for granted that well, if a nuclear weapon were used against Russia, they would certainly respond. But and they even always said that under certain circumstances, even a, a conventional attack would be replied, would receive a, a nuclear reply. It's, Am I wrong? It's a bit more complicated. Uh, technically, uh, what the uh, Russian uh, military doctrine says uh, is that uh, Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons. Uh, in uh, well, if it is attacked with nuclear weapons, uh, of course. Uh, but then, uh, in a case of a conventional aggression, aggression that threatens the very existence of the state. So that that's the full uh, formula. Uh, of course, people uh, kind of worried about these uh, new territories and whether uh, an attack uh, on those would be considered uh, as justification. Uh, but I think it was important uh, that uh, there was a clear sense. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's never been articulated. And I, as I usually say, it's not like these things uh, will be argued in court uh, or something like that. But, uh, but everybody knew that uh, an attack on uh, these territories uh, would in no way uh, be uh, considered an aggression that threatens the very existence of the state, mm -hmm. and uh, and that uh, that message uh, was uh, communicated in, in in a sense by the the uh, the international community, if you will, including uh, uh, including uh, various states like uh, again you as you mentioned uh, uh, China apparently. Uh, said something uh, about that uh, there was uh, uh, there was a very interesting phone call uh, between uh, the uh, Russian Minister of Defense and the Indian Minister of Defense and the Indian minister uh, basically said openly uh, to his uh, Russian counterpart that uh, any use of nuclear weapons uh, would be uh, against the very tenets of humanity so uh, and, and then again, we see uh, we see uh, statements uh, from uh, the uh, states uh, parties to the uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, (TPNW) uh, that uh, unequivocally uh, condemned uh, all nuclear threats. Uh, we've seen a, a, which was very interesting. We've seen uh, messages. Uh, uh, the G20 statement uh, actually also made it very. Uh, strong statement uh, about the uh, that nuclear threats are inadmissible i think that that's the word that they used uh we saw uh the message was in the joint biden uh, she statement uh, when they met so it was and then in a way uh basically the international community kind of uh, made it clear in my view that uh, Yes, any threat, uh, not to mention any use of nuclear weapons, would be unacceptable. And that uh, kind of what uh, made uh, Russia to uh, kind of uh, back off uh, rhetorically uh, and uh, uh, not to mention, well, rhetorically. Uh, and uh, the other step that we are away from uh, this kind of a, a brink is uh, that there has never been any kind of a practical preparation for uh well, you're okay, I would love to hear somebody say that, really make it stick, saying that even the threat of using nuclear weapons is unacceptable. Uh, I, if, if they say that, I think they probably do it in a very low tone of voice, because it's so obvious that the U.S. has made the same kinds of threats. I mean, Trump was talking about, sounded like the end of the world or something, you know, when he was <clears throat> boasting about the potential use of something awful. And I don't know whether he called it a nuclear weapon, but he certainly, that was what he was alluding to. So, uh, you know, is there any way of, 
of uh, imposing a norm that says you can't even threaten such a thing? I think, you know, you can try, um, but you can't pressure countries to do something or behave in a certain way unless it costs them something to do it. And so there has to be some consequences of it, of course. And that, again, becomes the issue of, you know, what what are the, the means by which, you know, the international community can pressure uh, Russia? I think it's one it's one thing to think about if Russia did use nuclear weapons, what kind of response would then happen? Mm-hmm. It would probably be a lot more severe than we've seen so far. Um, but for Russia to continue to issue nuclear threats, you know, they can turn up and down the, the rhetoric and, and whatever. That's a lot harder um, to control or dictate, of course. So um, so I don't know what's what we could do for that. We can try over a longer period of time, I think. Right now, we're in a very dynamic phase that where the uncertainties are centered around a major conventional war in Europe. And, and that makes it more volatile. Um, and so I think there is great, there's certainly plenty of reasons to be concerned, absolutely, and, and follow this uh, very closely. Um, but I don't think, um, it's not my impression uh, from talking to, to, offense, to defense officials here in the United States that they think the, the problem has sort of, um, you know, gotten less serious <laughs> because of uh, Putin's statements. The general view is that the closer Russia gets towards a military defeat, the more potentially, the more potentially risky it becomes. Um, it's one thing to talk about the four provinces that that Putin said he annexed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's it'll it'll be more volatile if we get to the point of uh, Russia getting pushed out of Crimea. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically also what happens to the Black Sea Fleet and these types of questions. Because, I mean, the Black Sea Fleet is an iconic military institution in the Russian military, considered part of, really, it's like a symbol of the state, of course. Um, there have been some some suggestions from former officials here in the United States that if Russia used tactical nuclear weapons, then a NATO should sort of lash out and, and, and do some conventional attacks against Russian forces in Ukraine, uh, including uh, one person, one former U.S. official uh, from the military said, including sinking the Black Sea Fleet. And I think that would be like, that would be a recipe to make things to a lot worse. Um, so it's very difficult how to predict where things will go. And it's very, very hard to 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 describe what what is the most um, productive reaction uh, if something happens. Mm-hmm. I'm in touch with various peace activist kinds of folks, and one guy from Ukraine who's a peace worker, uh, you know, appealed to uh, me as if I had something magical. Uh, to where can how can we influence uh, Modi and Xi? to really warn uh, Putin that no matter what happens, that's one thing he can't do. He cannot use, he may not use nuclear weapons or there'll be hell to pay for it. And um, of course I have, (laughs) who knows? Uh, But, you know, the whole thing is, is that he was already thinking then, this was several months ago, that (laughs) this would happen only when uh, he was beginning to really lose. And I don't know whether you can say that he's that uh, Putin is really losing now. It looks like he's certainly not doing well. But if he gets uh, his back to the wall and and he really can't function and carry on anymore, uh, then that's uh, it's hard for me to imagine uh, his uh, 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 you know doing anything like a graceful surrender, a capitulation, or a, uh, you know uh, even a ceasefire. Um, but on the other hand, I, I also can hardly imagine uh, NATO countries uh, either saying, well, I guess uh, we can't carry on any further. Whatever the terms are, we have to end this thing. 
so I guess what I'm saying is that we're not really specifically talking about nuclear weapons here. We're talking about strategic interaction of war planners and how what can what will happen when one of them responds to the other under certain circumstances. Yeah, Pavel. If I may, uh, yeah, I think back to your uh, question and the uh, to the. Uh, words of uh, your uh, fellow uh, activist from uh, Ukraine, uh, I think, and in, in my view, uh, and, and I, I, I've been watching this uh, development uh, with uh, some uh, attention, uh, and I've been advocating uh, that uh, this the message of uh, making uh, nuclear weapons uh, illegitimate, kind of a delegitimizing them, in uh, again, you you cannot do it. I mean, there is, as Hans correctly said, there is there is nothing you can do, kind of a uh, in in a material way. Uh, but uh, in my view, uh, it it has been done. Uh, and it uh, uh, the process uh, is underway, and and I I do believe that the process has been uh, generally uh, successful. Uh, because uh, again, uh, for example, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, states parties uh, to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, uh, they issued that statement uh, in the first uh, uh, meeting of state parties in June, and that was a blanket uh, blanket uh, uh, condemnation of all uh, threats threats uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, and and then that message kind of uh, actually again uh, it's a spread uh, because uh, you again uh, as uh, I mentioned the India of course uh, we don't expect uh, uh, India or China to uh, issue uh, kind of a strongly warn Russia that they will do this or that if Russia uses weapons uh, that doesn't probably work that way uh, but but it was clear that this uh, the message of concern the message of concern about this potential use that was uh, uh, that was communicated to Moscow and uh, that uh, kind of uh, uh, put them into a uh, defensive uh, rightly so uh, and and I in my view uh, the, the 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 best way of kind of a Continuing this uh, pressure is to continue this pressure and to, uh, for example, for the United States, for NATO to uh, actually uh, commit uh, not to use nuclear weapons uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in the situation in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, which I think there's been, and unfortunately, there's been some reluctance on the U.S. part. Uh, and more more than that, uh, there were uh, people not in the government, uh, luckily, uh, who were kind of very gung ho and who were saying that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of kind of a Russian nuclear threat because we also have uh, our own weapons. And I think that that's the uh, that's the recipe for disaster here uh, because the only kind of effective strategy is to. Uh, again, to de delegitimize these weapons, to make sure that uh, this is uh, any any thought about uh, using them uh, should be considered criminal. Well, absolutely, I would love to believe that that's all we have to do. But you know, that if if if, if people would take it seriously, what the TPNW say, parties say, but the you know Russia and the U.S. do not are not signatories. And so uh, how can we, I mean, I want to celebrate the, the achievements that have been made by the TPNW, but uh, it, it doesn't apply. For example, I believe uh, there's nothing in any of the existing treaties that even speaks about um, tactical weapons in Europe, for example. I mean, there's no prohibition against even there's no talk about that, is there? Yes. Let me, let me uh, just give you an example of uh, how the delegitimation uh, works, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Mm. So uh, imagine, for example, uh, that uh, people would start talking about uh, uh, Russia's uh, using chemical weapons if it loses Crimea or something. Mm. So, uh, and we know that chemical weapons are, I mean, there is a uh, chemical weapon convention, they are banned and all that. So that's the, uh, but imagine even if there is uh, nothing of the kind. So imagine if, uh, if in response to that, the United States would say, ah, we will use chemical weapons against you if you do that. I mean, you would agree that that would be, it's an inconceivable uh, situation here. Uh, and, yeah, yeah uh, but that, that is the logic of deterrence. I mean, but the that's, the, reason that's for what's wrong it. with the logic of deterrence. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, as I, yeah, as I say, I mean, uh, this is the, uh, basically, uh, if you subscribe to that, you are in the, uh, uh, the logic of deterrence is who can kill more people. And yeah, this is, yeah, if, so, and that, we need to make it clear that this is what it is about. It's not about the Black Sea Fleet. It's not about uh, something like that. It's not about uh, uh, tanks on the battlefield. Uh, it is about, in essence, uh, about killing people. And uh, once you start kind of thinking about this uh, in this way, uh, then you get people making their opinions about this, uh, this kind of threats. Uh, you were about to, to explain to me how it, persuasion was going to work, how we were going to convince people uh, to make the, <laughs> these things unacceptable. And, and that's where I, I would love to see that leap. I don't know how to do that because I've been spending the last 30, 40 years trying to convince people <laughs> to make nuclear weapons unacceptable. And I don't think I've re re reached my goal yet. Hans, do you think so? Do you see any progress along those lines? I think, that, in fact, the opposite. I think right now there's more support for, uh, you know, further militarization, further uh, modernization of, of, the, of both arsenals. Uh, et cetera, not, not the uh, su support declining. Yeah, ironically, I think that both sides of the aisle, so to speak, uh, have been strengthened <laughs> in mm. their mission. Um, uh, it's the typical thing with when, when people are faced with the threat of nuclear weapons, um, they fall into, you know, one of two camps. And one is that says, well, Obviously, we have to get rid of them. Uh, and the other camp says, well, it's precisely because they're dangerous that we need to keep them. <laughs> so in this case as well, uh, you see both sides, I think, feel somewhat vindicated. You know, people that are opposed to nuclear weapons say, well, this just shows that how outrageous and dangerous it is. We must we must do more to get rid of this and, and, and all that. But we also see a strengthening, I think, in the nuclear pro nuclear camp, where we're going to see for a variety of reasons, not just because of the the war in Ukraine, but because of a number of international developments, that there, there seems to be sort of a um, a hardening of the group of people and the philosophy that says nukes are here to stay, mm -hmm. uh, at least the way the world is today. Um, elimination is not the solution. Uh, there are other things that have to happen first. And while we work for that, we will continue to modernize. And this is, in, in fact, one of my, my biggest worries about this war, apart from the fact where they would be used, uh, nukes will be used or not, is that it seems to me that we're seeing sort of a revitalization of some of the thoughts and the thinking that underpinned the thinking about nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And, and I'm not suggesting it's going back and mimic exactly what it was during the Cold War. But we see this, for example, in the arguments that are being made for, you know, saying that nukes play an important role. And this war, this war illustrates that it's playing an important role. What's happening there with the threat means that we need to be more vigilant about this. 
what Russia is doing with tactical nuclear weapons and what China is doing with its nuclear buildup means that nuclear weapons will be more important, not less important. So I'm not saying I agree with all those arguments, but I do think that that is an, a powerful um, momentum that is underway in the pro-nuclear camp right now. So I think it I think it can strengthen both sides, so to speak. Um, uh, there's a battle to be had uh, in the next decade or so mm -hmm. about uh, where should the thrust of the international community go in this matter. Pavel, now you were uh, convinced that you can persuade a guy like Hans, who, or <laughs> the, no, the I, I, point no, of view that he was, uh, he's trying to enunciate. How uh, how would you answer exactly that argument that we are going to have even greater need and reliance on him and give more have to give more significance to nuclear weapons? I don't know how to persuade people. Give me my arguments. Please. I actually, uh, I, I totally agree with Hans uh, in that uh, there, there are you, you, you can definitely see uh, people uh, saying that oh, uh, all this means that we need more nuclear weapons and we need uh, better or what have you. Uh, but uh, my my take is that well, it is. It, there, there, there will be these caps, uh, but but in in many ways, uh, it's the moment. Uh, what I would say, uh, this is the argument is up for grabs. I mean, this is this is the moment where you could, and and I think at least uh, we should uh, take this uh, uh, and uh, uh, turn this debate into uh, the uh, non-nuclear uh, kind of uh, dimension. And uh, my, I actually, uh, I am contemplating, uh, and I, I, I do think that uh, if you if you think about uh, this situation, then uh, you could actually say that it shows that nuclear weapons are obsolete. They don't, they don't do you much, actually. It is true. You could say that. Well, yeah, but Russia sort of kept. The West out of the war uh, by you th the threat of uh, nuclear use, uh, which might or might not be true. That's uh, the other thing. Uh, or the, yes, you could say that these uh, nuclear weapons en enabled Russia to start this war. Uh, that's probably correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you ask yourself, uh, maybe was it actually did it do Russia any good? Maybe it would have been better <laughs> off not being able to start this war. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you think about uh, kind of a in in any conceivable uh, sense, and absolutely, uh, totally any uh, by any measure you could think of, Russia is much worse off today than it was uh, on the twenty third of February, and in fact, uh, back uh, all the way to uh, twenty thirteen uh, before Crimea. There is absolutely no gain, zero. It's all negative. Uh, there is nothing there. So then, sort of, you 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 ask, sort of, what? Maybe maybe Russia would be again better off. And I'm uh, again, I'm on the record saying that Russia would have been. A much happier, more, much more prosperous, and much more secure country without nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the argument uh, that could be applied uh, pretty much to 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 all uh, nuclear weapon states. Okay, Even let's apply it to China because the one China. Thing me, you know the question is why are they expanding their arsenal so much? Uh, and uh, I mean they must. They started doing that before the Ukraine war, though. So they cannot have been influenced by the whatever considerations were going on in Putin's head. Uh, what do you think is going on in Xi's head, uh, Hans? Because, uh, you know, what, why are they expanding their, their, their weapons? They clearly must believe that there is a percentage in it for them. And uh, they must accept this... Uh, doctrine that you've counterposed to what you and I want to believe. 
Yeah, I th <laughs> there's a lot of debate about then now exactly what it is that <laughs> drives China. Um, I, I don't think it's one thing. Um, it's a combination of factors, most likely. At least that's the most um, appealing theory that, <laughs> that I hear uh, out there. Uh, there's an element that has to do with um, Xi's decisions, of course, that he has declared that China has to be a world-class military power. And when you are a world-class military power, well, you look at Russia and, and the United States, and, and that means certain things for your military uh, capabilities. Um, and so that is probably a, an important driver. Um, there's also one that has to do with um, the, the extent to which China feels that its existing nuclear arsenal is vulnerable to a first strike. Uh, we can discuss, of course, how likely that is, but those those factors tend to be really important for driving force structures, um, and especially when you think about what the Chinese what China China is building right now. I mean, most most dramatically, of course, is this the discovery of uh, three large uh, missile silo fields, and if they all turn into silos, and if they're all loaded with nuclear weapons, then of course that is a significant expansion and but also very, I, let's ask you, first of all how certain is it that they really are missile silos and not uh, some mistaken speculation on the west's part it, it's it's pretty certain <laughs> um i mean to the extent that we have as statements from intelligence communities from not just one or a couple but from many different angles of intelligence communities, um, the observations that we can make by looking at these facilities and how they're being built, uh, what are the structures, etc. Um, so, you know, to the best of my knowledge, at least, they, they are certain silos. But, uh, but again, what we don't know is how much of this infrastructure will actually be filled with missiles, you know, worst case scenario, all of them. Um, but the other option, could China put only missiles in some of them? Uh, and then, of course, have this kind of a shell game that people have been talking about. We don't know. We just don't know where it's where it's going to go yet. Um, I think those fields are still, you know, uh, half to a full decade underway from full operational capability. But that is pro probable. It's probable that some parts of it could become operational sooner than that. But we'll see. But the bottom line here is that China sees it as necessary uh, to not just rely on ICB, road mobile ICBMs for its long range strike capabilities. And increasingly, and more so now it seems, rely on these big silo missile fields that look very sort of American in, in a way. Um, and so that's one way of thinking. Perhaps they want to have to secure physically as uh, you know secure retaliatory capability and and they have concluded that the best way to do that is to spread missiles out in silos over lost large areas okay now i hadn't thought about the the question of i think you you mentioned it's it they pref, they're going to prefer hard silos, silos yeah. over mobile yeah. form. what oh, i don't even know what these mobile things are are they on railway Cars or or what is a mobile? No, the, anyway? the mobile. Other than, uh, of course, there's submarines. Do they have submarines? They have a small fleet of six submarines. Um, they're not very capable yet uh, in terms of operations, but they're getting better anyway. But in terms of their land-based missile force, um, previously it has been overwhelmingly focused on road mobile missiles, and that was an explicit attempt to reduce the vulnerability of the ICBMs. And, um, and so they look, there are these big uh, multi-axle uh, launchers that drive around a missile on the back, similar to the Russian uh, road mobile Yars and you know the SS-27 and SS-25s. Um, so, but now they're, they're getting to a point where they probably have something in the order of 150, plus um, road mobile ICBMs. Um, but now they're adding um, these large numbers of silos, apparently. And we're counting something in the order of 
350 silos under construction. Um, so that's for China, a significant shift. Um, mm -hmm. And so presumably it means something. It means that there's an, there's an operational interest here. There is a you know, secure retaliatory capability interest here as well. If you put, if these silos are hardened and you put um, a, a, you know, a solid fuel missile and you have an early warning system, then of course you can do what the Americans and the Russians have been doing for decades, <laughs> which is to sort of put your forces on alert if necessary. So they can respond quickly before they're destroyed in their silos. So that's okay, now, this, one you, scenario. You, you and I are are strategists trying to plan our nuclear, uh, you know, arsenal. And I mean, I have uh, I haven't thought about the advantages of of uh, silo based missiles over mobile ones. I've never even thought about mobile ones. But pre presumably, the no mobile ones are not as good or not. I, I presume there are still ICBMs that supposedly could hit, hit, go anywhere on the world if they want to. Uh, so they must have they must have some idea that you know having a silo is is better. But you know if I were if I were running a a nuclear arsenal, I think I would put all of my eggs in one basket. I would just make a whole bunch, not even very many, but a few submarines, and that would be enough. But there are planes. There are all, all kinds of other things you could do. Why would? Uh, what are the advantages over having a, a particular combination of of um, deploy? You know, force types of of, of uh, installations. Why wouldn't people be just happy having a? Um, especially since the Chinese say that. <clears throat> they have a no force use policy <clears throat> and they don't they're not looking to initiate a war presumably and or if they are consistent then why shouldn't they just be happy to have a few good submarines with something like the trident uh, missiles it, sorry I, I just I, I was just in uh it, it it never works this way <laughs> it never worked that way Why? uh rational arguments uh, even if they are uh, you know, even if they seem rational they 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 not they are not something that kind of carries the day in this uh this kind of discussions uh so and and then uh but more seriously, I, I think uh, you. It is a very kind of a uh, American thinking that uh, oh, submarines are the kind of a survivable, and uh, this is uh, you. You want to. Uh, you may want to uh, put everything uh, at sea and all that, but. Uh, you could, uh, and I, I, I did this uh, for uh, the Soviet uh, kind of forces, and you could make a very good argument uh, in that uh, your uh, silo-based uh, multiple warhead uh, ICBMs are the best thing since sliced bread. They are. Uh, they give you exactly the retaliatory capability that that you want. Uh, it, it it has mostly to do with the kind of uh, your ability to uh, deliver uh, orders, uh, launch orders, and all that. And uh, so they are they could they could work if if you are if you want to make them work. So that's uh, again that's I I would just kind of uh, say that uh, there are. There, there, there are explanations for pretty much everything, and you could build a, uh, uh, you could build an argument uh, in favor of any leg of the triad. Hans, what do you think? No, uh, <laughs> these these forces can be. They're not. There's not a natural law out there that says that nuclear forces have to be structured this way. It's a choice that countries make. And some countries, the Brits are very happy with having one platform, right? The submarines, you know, they, they've given up on all of the other things they have. Um, the Americans quite clearly put most, in terms of their 
potential quite clearly puts put most emphasis on the ballistic missile submarines. But the, but it's also they have two open coasts. Nobody, there's no choke points or anything like that. You you go straight out into the open ocean oceans. The Chinese not so. You know their missile submarine base is down in the South China Sea. Um, it's boxed in theoretically. Yeah, it's a it's a big area, and you, there are ways to operate in there. You can put things behind a bastion of attack submarines or what have you. Uh, or you can sail some up into the Bohai Sea, which is sort of an inland sea they have, and hope they will survive a little longer there. And, <laughs> you know, and the Russians, you know, of course, has their ballistic, main ballistic missile fleet up on the Kola Peninsula with access up into the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard for them to sort of, well, very hard, but it's more difficult for them to operate down through the Norwegian Sea into the Atlantic Ocean. They used to do that in the past, but these days uh, the missiles have longer ranges. They don't really have to go that far out. So different countries posture their forces in different ways uh, for all these reasons. So I think it's more interesting to look at the Chinese in terms of what is the symbolism that the Chinese military or the Chinese leadership mm -hmm. wants to portray or convey with the force structure they're building because, of course, we're looking at it. We're concluding all sorts of things. We're saying, oh, they're diversifying. That must mean hmm, that the, the role of their nuclear weapons might be increasing because that's the way we think about when we diversify, right? But it's not clear at all that that is you know, necessarily what is happening. It might, but it's not clear that it is. So many things need to be sort of... Uh, revealed, discussed, what have you, about why they're doing what they're doing and where they're going with it. Well, both of you will say it could go either way. You could say, well, all of this war has just proved that, that nuclear weapons are useless and a waste of money and even too dangerous to keep or whatever. And so let's get rid of them. But is there any reason to think that any any political power within China is is moving in that direction. I, I don't hear it, but, uh, you know, they have they've had long histories of proposing, you know, constraints on nuclear uh, force developments. They have for many, many decades adhered to this. We wanted a minimum deterrent. We wanted no first use. We promised not to attack other countries with nuclear weapons in nuclear weapons free zones or countries that don't have nuclear weapons. Um, and but they've also had this uh, policy, of course, that you know it's it's for you guys, Russia and and the United States, to make some agreements about reducing your nuclear forces because they're so vastly greater than the ones we have. And so, popularly, they've been saying things. When you come down to our level, then we'll talk. <laughs> you know, that's been the kind of uh, the the populist kind of line here. But of course, now we're in a situation where it appears that the Chinese more than any other nuclear weapon state on the planet is increasing its forces. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in a different category now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much harder to decipher from that development if that means the Chinese threat is getting greater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another issue, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of what they're doing, the money they, they put into it, the number of weapon systems they're flushing out, they're in a completely new category. And by the way, of course, they're, they're, um, they're part of the P5s, the original signatories of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They have a responsibility to pursue negotiations in good faith for reduction in nuclear forces, right? They can't just in perpetuity sit out on the sideline and say, no, 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 we don't want to do any of this until you come down to our level. So, so I don't see that there is a push or there, there's any political or regime movement in China to, you know, change where they're going right now. Um, who knows what the future will bring, but that they've seemed to have chosen this path right now. Well, a, a while back, uh, Trump was, uh, when I think he was, they were discussing the negotiation of the, of the new start, yeah. uh, the extension of the new start. And, and he said something like, well, it's, it's it shouldn't just be a bilateral uh, agreement. Uh, none of these nuclear weapons conventions should be 
just bilateral. Let's get uh, let's only go for this kind of conference. If if China will participate, and uh, of course uh, I assume that everybody realized that that was a non-starter. It was just an excuse. But is is uh, is there any uh, anybody still making that seriously making that pitch that there needs to be some um, more ambitious and more inclusive kind of conference to negotiate some kind of a new nuclear a, a, a deal? Uh, I don't know. I it it could go all kind of ways uh and uh, uh one one possibility of bringing china in uh which uh, i believe uh, is uh, actually uh, could be very productive uh, is uh limiting uh the amount of uh, fissile materials uh we uh we know as far as we can tell uh, there is uh, there is just simply not enough plutonium in China to uh, build warheads for all those hundreds of missiles, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are ways for China to produce that plutonium, but it it hasn't uh, been producing it yet. Uh, and so, if you have a regime that uh, uh, limits uh, the fissile material cutoff treaty that limits production of material for weapons. That would not would be a reasonable step, and China supports this idea, and uh, so it is just a matter of bringing others into the fold. And oh, so you, do you see it the same way? Yeah, I think there are ways to uh, go about this potentially, um, but we have to remember, of course, no country enters into an agreement unless they are, there's something in it for them, mm -hmm. right? So what we have completely missed so far is any articulation of what is it that uh, China would be offered in response to going into agreements that would be in China's interest. Mm -hmm. Unless we articulate that, are unable to sell that to the Chinese or the Chinese, you know, on, on their own decide, oh, mm -hmm. gee, this is too dangerous. We need to do something about it. You know, obviously then there is a national interest in doing this. It's not going to happen because the West says, you should do this. You know, It's going to happen because the Chinese say, yeah, that makes sense. There's something in it for us. Um, so we have to be much better at articulating what is it that is in for the Chinese. Get mm -hmm. conversations going with them about what that is. Help them articulate what it is and articulate to them what we're willing to trade in return. We'll let them sell their 5Gs globally if they'll get rid of their nuclear weapons. <laughs> no, I think it's it's there. There have been some very important conversations going on with the Chinese over the last 20 years at various levels, um, even before that. But, at, you know, track 1.5, track 2, where officials or former officials get together and they they chat and talk about these issues, what they mean, you know, uh, part part of that sound conversation has probably to start from that pool of experience, uh, if you will. Um, but but again, no country makes an agreement about arms control and anything else unless there's something in it for them. So why would we why would we think the Chinese would do that? Well, Pavel has to leave, and it's time for us to wind this up anyway. Although I'd love to keep going for another hour. So thank you both very, very much. This is such an important topic that bless your hearts for doing the work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Project Save the World produces these shows, and this is episode number 530. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to tosavetheworld.ca. You can share information there, too, about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar, or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word peace. You will see buttons to click to subscribe.